This video is sponsored by Ridge and their wallet and key case. The next update for your wallet and keys is here and you can get 10% off your order by using offer code SKILLUP. Click the link below to get to it or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gamers, this is one hell of a week of content, let me tell you. We had the Dead Island 2 review go up last night. It's okay, the game that is. The review is amazing, of course, as always. Right now, you are tuned in to This Week in Video Games. Apologies if you clicked on it by mistake or were suckered in by clickbait. I try my best and it's nice to know that works sometimes. Later this week, I'm very excited to bring you a review of Star Wars Jedi Survivor. I have review code for that one. I'm currently playing through it right now. I love the original and was very excited for that one to hit my inbox. Expect that review to hit your sub boxes before the week is out. And ideally, I'd love to be able to put out something for the Horizon Forbidden West DLC since code for that one went out just prior to release and I've been busy with Jedi and Dead Island. So yeah, I was not joshing ya. It's a huge week of content and I'm pumped for it. Before all that, we should probably talk about some gaming news, right? Sounds like a good idea. Biggest story of the week is the potential discord at the house that Bill builds. It started rather innocently with a passing comment from Jeff Grubb during his Game Mess podcast. Here he is talking about the shadow dropped Hi-Fi Rush from developer Tango Works. Take a listen. I, I mean, I gotta say, like, I think I disagreed with you at the time, but what, based on what I've heard, it it just straight up didn't make the money it needed to make. So it's a curious comment from Jeff because it implies that Hi-Fi Rush was meant to make money, which obviously every game is meant to make money, don't get me wrong, but this one in particular felt like it was intended to pump Game Pass subscriptions. If we were to just look at the box sales, then yeah, sure, obviously Hi-Fi Rush isn't gonna be anything to write home about, even though it was outselling Forspoken on Steam during its opening weekend. Regardless, point is, Game Pass makes the process of determining the monetary success of a game rather tricky. Things got more interesting when Xbox clapped back. Aaron Greenberg heads up games marketing at Xbox. He took to Twitter to say, quote, Hi-Fi Rush was a breakout hit for us and our players in all key measurements and expectations. We couldn't be happier with what the team at Tango Gameworks delivered with this surprise release, end quote. So again, a somewhat curious comment from Greenberg because at no time did he say that Hi-Fi Rush sold gangbusters, but he could have been implying that when he said all key measurements, because surely the bottom line is the measurement that Microsoft cares about the most. But still, it stands to reason that Hi-Fi Rush did not make big money for Microsoft unless it resulted in a surge of Game Pass subscriptions, which hopefully it did, to be honest, because it's an awesome game. But because Microsoft don't release that sort of information, we'll likely never know. What was perhaps more interesting than all of this was Grubb's comment a few moments later in the podcast. Take a listen. These are real consequences that are going on inside Microsoft right now, right? I mean, mm -hmm. do you think management is happy with the state of Xbox right now? I can tell like, you, that's... I can tell you they are not. So Grubb is a pretty well-connected, well-sourced operator. It's highly unlikely that he's talking out his ass here. So when he says that he knows Microsoft management are not happy with the state of Xbox, I'm inclined to believe him. And so are a bunch of other people. That set off a round of discourse this week with people taking a big step back and asking the question, how is Microsoft doing this generation? Some argue it's going great guns as the success of Game Pass has created a paradigm shift in the industry, while others point to the lack of flagship AAA entries and the flop of Halo Infinite as proof that Microsoft haven't got nearly the same momentum that Sony and Nintendo do. I mean, my personal take, I don't touch my Xbox console ever, but that's only because Xbox have invested in PC parity. Now I can choose to play on console or PC and I always choose PC. And I think that's just a straight up upgrade for how I enjoy games. I wish Sony did that, but I understand why they don't. Furthermore, Game Pass is inarguably very rad. And even though Sony have tried to spin up their own version of it lately, Game Pass still has more games and more day one releases than Sony can commit to. I straight up recommend Game Pass to any of my casual non-gamer friends thinking about getting into gaming. And that's gotta count for something, right? But at the same time, yeah, where's Xbox's God of War or even their Horizon? Forza is nice, but it's not a system seller the way that God of War is or Breath of the Wild is. Right now, there's a lot of hope being pinned on Starfield, and if that doesn't deliver the goods and the Activision Blizzard deal somehow falls through, I think people are gonna be asking some very big questions about the future of Xbox. For now, I'm holding out hope that the second half of this generation is kinder to Xbox than the first. Xbox has so many studios working on games I'm very keen to play, I just hope those games arrive inside the next, you know, five or six years. That'll be nice. You think I'm exaggerating? Well, this week, Microsoft revealed in their submissions relating to the Activision Blizzard acquisition that they are currently at work on a massive AAA sequel that they estimate will take 10 years to deliver. The filing reads, quote, 
For instance, according to one Microsoft executive, Redacted, a forthcoming title from the Redacted franchise, may take a decade to develop, end quote. What is Redacted? I don't know, but I sure should hope it isn't Elder Scrolls 6, even though I secretly think it's Elder Scrolls 6. 10 years to develop a AAA sequel? You constantly hear from industry insiders that the AAA model is utterly broken beyond repair, and I can think of no better argument for that than a 10-year development cycle for a single game. Can you imagine the microtransactions required to earn back that development cost? I don't want to think about it, man. That's some Genshin Impact money right there. Sticking with Xbox just a little bit longer, we got some insights into how Team Green might be handling handhelds in the future. This discussion was brought into focus when a still unconfirmed PlayStation handheld was leaked. Though apparently that's only going to support remote play, which is a bit enough enough. Around the same time, The Verge reported that Microsoft were doing some work in the handheld market, though in an unofficial capacity and not even using Microsoft hardware. A leaked internal hackathon project shows that at least a few people at Microsoft Microsoft are kicking around the idea of creating a Windows mode for existing handheld PCs like the Steam Deck. It would essentially be a launcher you could load onto those devices, allowing you to access the Xbox ecosystem without all the hassle of having to navigate through Windows, which is possible on those devices, but it isn't a great user experience. Given that handheld PCs are taking off at the moment, an Xbox push into this space makes a lot of sense, since they could market Game Pass and the broader Xbox ecosystem to an entirely new market segment without any of the risks of developing and shipping expensive hardware. It's very clever, and I hope the project graduates from hackathon to actual thing, because I'd be very keen for something like this on my Steam Deck. Hey, remember Joseph Staten, the former creative lead of the Halo franchise who just left Microsoft? I had speculated that it was to start his own studio, but turns out, nope, he's off to Netflix. He announced the news on Twitter himself, quote, So today I'm thrilled to announce that I've joined Netflix Games as creative director for a brand new AAA multi-platform game and original IP. Let's go, end quote. Netflix are tooling up for a big push into gaming at the moment with multiple newly formed studios working on a mix of new and adapted IP. It'll likely be a number of years before we hear what Joe's working on, but I'll keep you posted. An interesting story about Deathloop popped up this week. We'd always assumed that it was meant to be the next big thing from Arcane after Prey, but it turns out that isn't quite the case. Speaking to Rock Paper Shotgun, Rafael Colantonio, one of Arcane's co-founders, revealed that Deathloop was initially just meant to be a bit of side hustle to keep the team busy while they figured out what their next major project was. Quote, Bethesda wanted us to do something. They didn't quite know where we were going after Dishonored. Do we want Dishonored 3? I don't know. Let's make something simple and short before and let's see. And then Deathloop became a big thing over the years. That was the funny thing. Nah, we don't want to do Dishonored 3, but if you can pitch us a small game, something that maybe has multiplayer so we can learn multiplayer, something that maybe has microtransactions, maybe something with a lot of recycling like a roguelike, end quote. Huh, something that has multiplayer, something that has microtransactions, something that has a lot of recycled content. Is this a brief for Deathloop or Fallout 76? Probably both, I'd say. Xbox bought Bethesda some years back, and now they're trying to land a much bigger fish in the form of Activision Blizzard King, though the Blizzard part of that equation may be in more trouble than Microsoft suspect. This week, a Blizzard producer took to Twitter to lament the current exodus of staff, saying that Blizzard is hemorrhaging talent at an alarming rate. In doing so, he made an interesting reveal, quote, we are creating crisis maps of what we can or cannot ship. That is the loss of capacity we're facing, end quote. Not a great sign anytime the word crisis is invoked, unless it's in relation to Final Fantasy VII spin-offs. Blizzard's talent exodus is well documented at this point, with a number of greybeards having recently departed to set up their own shops, but this framing of it makes the matter seem much more urgent. Unclear what Microsoft's acquisition might do to stem the bleeding, since even if that does go through, it's likely that Activision Blizzard and King will still be managed as separate entities, similar to the way that Bethesda is left to its own devices for the moment. That was a hell of a lot of Xbox and Xbox adjacent news, wasn't it? Guess we should probably do some PlayStation news now, and what could be more PlayStation than news of another studio acquisition? This week, Sony announced that it had acquired Firewalk Studios. What a Firewalk made? Nothing to this point. There are brand new studios spun up a few years ago that entered into a publishing agreement with Sony to put out a AAA multiplayer title. That deal was struck back in 2021 and we haven't heard anything since then, but obviously Sony is so happy with the progress on that title that they felt the need to snap up the studio before anyone else got the chance. Firewalk is just the latest in a string of discrete studio acquisitions, including the likes of Nexus, Bluepoint, Haven, and more. It's an aggressive acquisition strategy, but one that stands in stark contrast to Microsoft, since it's about smaller, targeted purchases rather than buying in 
entire publishing labels with all the overhead and risk that goes with that. Interesting though, Sony have been copying some blowback as a result of their efforts to block Microsoft's acquisition of Activision Blizzard. Members of the United States Senate took an interest in the matter during a hearing on trade. Senator Maria Cantwell asked a US trade representative if Sony was engaged in behavior that violated the spirit of the US-Japan trade agreement. She was referring to Sony's penchant for Japanese exclusives, a strategy so successful that it's seen decades worth of Japan's best games locked behind a PlayStation paywall. It's very likely that that question is a direct result of Sony's meddling in the Microsoft Activision deal, as that deal would see Microsoft, an American company, snap up another American company, Activision Blizzard. And politicians are naturally going to get a bit territorial when it comes to companies from other nations trying to upset a deal like that. For now, Congress are just raising questions, highlighting concerns, but it'll be interesting to see if they choose to take the matter any further. If the Activision Blizzard deal goes through, I expect this will be the last we hear about it. One last PlayStation tidbit, Spider-Man voice actor Yuri Lowenthal has said that he has wrapped up motion capture for Spider-Man 2. He made the reveal during a Reddit Q&A for a completely different role. It doesn't mean anything in and of itself because motion capture can be wrapped up at almost any point during a game's production, but it does lend credence to the well-circulated rumor that Spider-Man 2 will be launching sometime around September this year. It is still very much unconfirmed, and if it's true, we'll likely hear about it at the next PlayStation Showcase, which could be very soon. All right, we did Xbox, we did PlayStation. We should probably check in on the third major console now, the Soldier Boy console. Turns out that still doesn't exist. So let's talk about Nintendo instead. This week they hosted an indie showcase and it was a pretty good time. One big reveal was the release date for Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. You might remember this one as the game that's picking up where Jet Set Radio left off, going so far as to invite back the original game's composer. The game is now locked in for an August 18th release, which is potentially well-timed if the rumors of a Jet Set Radio remake are at all true. Smart to get this one out the door before Sega gets the drop on them. Oxenfree 2 Lost Signals got a release date as well, July 12th, and Blasphemy 2 was revealed. This is the follow-up to the 2D Souls-like action RPG with its very fucked up religion-inspired art style and iconography. Just really creepy and really cool, especially if you went to a Catholic school like I did. No day for this one yet, but it's dropping sometime northern summer this year. Personally, the trailer I was most excited to see was for Animal Well, the game being published by Donkey's indie label, Big Mode. Not only does this game look fantastic, but how fucking funny is it that Donkey is in a direct? Sort of. Xenoblade fans are not at all happy about that one, let me tell you. I've actually spoken to some people who have seen Animal Well up close and they've had nothing but glowing things to say about it. So it appears as though Donkey and Leah have picked a winner here. We'll find out for ourselves when the game launches Northern Winter this year. And finally, an update on that potential revival of Lawbreakers, though the news is a bit of a bummer. Earlier, series creator Cliff Blazinski had teased something related to Lawbreakers, saying that he had just received an update from his lawyers and that we should stay tuned. We had all speculated that Cliff was eyeing a potential revival of Lawbreakers, which was a critical darling, but a commercial flop on a cataclysmic scale. This week, Cliffy B tweeted out an update saying, quote, well, turns out Nexon does own the rights to Lawbreakers. Owen oh, Mahoney, how about sliding into my DMs so we can talk about a resurrection, end quote. Mahoney is the CEO of Nexon, and yeah, you can't imagine that they're going to be super keen to wade into what's going to be a pretty risky endeavor, since a revival would require a pivot to a free-to-play model, which would require a lot of upfront dev time from people who will need to be hired specifically to do the work, because there is no studio right now that supports Lawbreakers. I think we had all secretly hoped that Cliffy might shoulder this one himself, buy the rights, stand up a small dev outfit and bootstrap the game out the door. But that ain't happening, it seems. When asked if he wanted to bring the game back or potentially work on a new title, Cliffy responded with, quote, I'm over being CEO and lead designer. Shiz is exhausting. But if a third party wants to resurrect it with Nexon, I'm down for consulting, end quote. I think that's very unlikely, Cliffy B. It pains me to say it, but it does feel like Lawbreakers just died again. A quick lightning round to finish off. The Steam Deck is coming to Japan and Korea April 29th. Similar to other regions, Valve will partner with a retail distributor by the name of Kumondo to get the job done. When asked about the potential for an Australian or New Zealand release, Gabe took a long puff of his old Toby, shook his head and disappeared back into his hobbit house. He lives in New Zealand, don't you know? And since I'm currently reading The Lord of the Rings again, that joke seemed funny in my head. Hey, speaking of Lord of the Rings, did you know that the upcoming Golem game is paywalling the inclusion of the Elvish language behind a deluxe edition of the game? If you buy the Precious Edition, in-game elves will speak their language, known as Sindarin. If you buy the regular Pleb Edition, they'll just speak the common tongue, because that's what you get when you're a poor commoner who doesn't buy deluxe editions, I guess.
One more piece of news from Jeff Grubb this week. For a long time, he's been hinting that a major PlayStation showcase was on the way before E3 would have been in June. In his podcast this week, he doubled down on that, saying that a showcase in May is a very safe bet. This is apparently going to be a big one for PlayStation, setting out the next phase for the PS5 and potentially even some hardware announcements. Like that weird-ass remote play handheld that got leaked. Is any of this true? Who knows? We will find out soon, I guess. Apparently, we were a womp rat's tail away from getting Star Wars Battlefront 3. That reveal comes from Michael Barclay, formerly of EA Dice, but now at Naughty Dog. He said that the sequels cancelled two yards from the finish line. A real shame, because other than the loot boxes, Battlefront 2 was pretty awesome, and it would have been nice to see that series continue. We're getting a Street Fighter 6 demo. Well, actually, it's available right now for PS4 and 5 owners, but everyone else will get it on April 26. It includes a few characters, some customization, a bit of the World Tour stuff, a nice way to get all warmed up for that June 2nd release. Ubisoft are bringing four of their existing games to Steam. They include Far Cry 6, pretty good, Riders Republic, very good, Monopoly Madness, no idea, and Rainbow Six Extraction. Please, for the love of God, do not buy that. It follows a recent trend from the publisher to shift their games onto Steam after a period of epic and Ubisoft Connect exclusivity, and hopefully in future we can just skip straight to day one Steam releases. That would be really great, thanks. Speaking of Ubisoft, X Defiance closed beta has just wrapped up and it had over 1 million players participate. That's pretty good, and you know what's even better? The game is alright. I played a bunch of it and quite enjoyed it. If you want to learn more, I'll leave a link to my preview coverage below the like button. And finally, did you feel that? It's as if 147 gigabytes suddenly cried out in terror and were suddenly full. That's right, the system specs for Jedi Survivor have been revealed and the game requires 147 gigabytes of hard drive space for PS5, similar for Xbox Series and PC. EA really looked at Call of Duty install sizes and thought, I can top that. I mean, at least you'd be able to preload it two days prior to launch, but I feel like in Australia, we're gonna need like six weeks to download that, so wish us luck. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, outside of that Nintendo Indie Showcase earlier, there weren't a whole lot of announcements this week. One of them was for a first party Nintendo announcement though. The next Xenoblade Chronicles 3 DLC is shipping on April 25th. This is a piece of story DLC that somehow brings characters from previous Xenoblade games into the mix. It's the final piece of DLC for the celebrated JRPG, and you gotta guess that the studio is now hard at work on their next big thing, which will surely ship for the Switch 2. Or just a remaster of Xenoblade Chronicles X, I'd be more than happy with that. Humanity is a title revealed just a short time ago. It's a Lemmings type game that looks promising for a bunch of reasons, not least of all because it's made by the same people who made the Game of the Year contender Tetris Effect. This one is also shipping with PSVR 2 support, which is pretty rad. There was a demo up recently that everybody loved, and now the title has an official release date, May 16th, exclusive to PlayStation consoles for now. The only other announcement this week was for an unexpected return to Sanctuary. In a Diablo 4 developer livestream, Blizzard dropped the surprising news that they will be hosting yet another open beta, this time from May 12th to 14th. They're calling it the Server Slam Weekend, and as an added sweetener, anyone who logs in and or takes down a world boss will get exclusive rewards when the full game releases but it's important to remember that your character progress from the beta will not carry over into the full release. That is an open beta available to every man and his skeleton dog. So what came out last week? Four releases to circle back to. The first is Disney Speedstorm, a new kart racer from mobile game maker Gameloft. Only this one is coming to consoles and PC. It's free to play eventually, but for now you'll need to pony up some dough for a founder kit. I don't think anyone had high expectations for this one, but apparently it's okay. Steam users have it at a mostly positive 70, while critics are in a similar spot putting it at a nice 69 on Open Critic. Push Square scored it a 7 saying, quote, There are some reservations about how well the free-to-play monetization will work as we move forward, but looking just at the game itself, it's not a bad time, end quote. And IGN seemed to zero in on those concerns with their racing dude, Luke Riley, scoring the game a 5 and saying, quote, Disney Speedstorm is a fundamentally good kart racer currently buried beneath so much gacha garbage and so many currencies that it almost seems like a parody of the entire free-to-play genre, end quote. Like I said, we really didn't expect much different. The Horizon Forbidden West Burning Shores DLC dropped last week exclusive to the PS5. Sadly, I and every other reviewer was unable to review it prior to release as Sony did not send out pre-release review code. Bit odd for them to be honest, since they usually send their stuff out well in advance. If you're wondering if this is perhaps an indictment on the quality of the DLC, probably not, since the title is sitting at a strong 81 on OpenCritic. 
God is a Geek scored at an 8, saying, quote, Horizon Forbidden West Burning Shores offers more of the same with some new ideas, yet it's still well worth playing and looks gorgeous, end quote. While Digital Trends scored this one 3.5 stars and said, quote, Horizon Forbidden West Burning Shores is a light but crowd-pleasing DLC chapter that sets the stage for Aloy's next adventure, end quote. Nintendo's long-awaited remaster of the Advance Wars series is finally here, and it seems to have landed well despite the controversy surrounding its delay. This is, of course, the classic 2D top-down turn-based strategy game revitalized with all new visuals and some lovely cutscenes to boot. Eurogamer recommended this one, saying, quote, Nintendo's turn-based classic is back in a generous new compilation, end quote. GameSpot were a little harsh at scoring this one as 7 and saying, quote, Advance Wars 1 plus 2 reboot camp's uneven campaigns are held up by rock-solid gameplay and great presentation, end quote. And finally, Dead Island 2. All right, here we go. So first up, I reviewed this one. Link below the like button. I liked it. I did. I'm not at all surprised that I liked it, given what I played in the preview. It's an unambitious but inoffensive semi-open world zombie game. I mean, it's pretty hard to fuck that up. And just by doing the basics well and not outstaying its welcome, Dan Buster managed to finally land a game that's been circling the landing strip for nearly 10 years. But yeah, it's far from an essential purchase, and that $70 price tag really does feel a bit cheeky compared to what a lot of other titles are offering for that price point these days. It's just a 7 out of 10 game that may or may not hit right for you based on your interest in it and how much you end up paying for it. That's it, really. That 7 out of 10 sentiment isn't a phrase, mind you. The game is sitting at a strong 76 on Open Critic, with basically every review scoring it a 7. Like Metro Game Central, for example, who said, quote, A surprisingly lean and mean sequel which amplifies the bloody thrills of the original through its impressive presentation and flexible mechanics, end quote. GameSpot with another 7, quote, Dan Buster Studios raises the dead in a vicious sequel, long thought doomed, end quote. There were some outliers, though. Survivor scored it a 5 and said, quote, There's little motivation to slog through extremely samey missions and side quests it's the general feeling that permeates through Dead Island 2. What's on offer isn't broken or flagrantly bad, with the exception of the checkpointing system, but it's tired, antiquated, and bland, end quote. For what it's worth, I don't think he's wrong. I just think it comes down to how in the mood you are for something that you have absolutely played before and played better versions of it. Either way, Dead Island 2 is out now on PlayStation, Xbox, and the Epic Store. I would bet big money on steep discounts and a tour of the subscription services very soon. So what's coming out this week? A few interesting things, actually. First up is Strayed Lights. I actually shouted this one out last week as part of my Put This On Your Radar segment. It's a third-person action-adventure game where the combat is centered on parrying with the added twist of you needing to be the same color as the attacks you are deflecting. This is a debut title from a small studio and it's hitting all platforms on the 25th. Biggest release of the week by far is Honkai Star Rail. This is from MiHoYo, makers of the absurdly successful Genshin Impact. This is the first new game they've put out since Genshin put them on the map a few years ago. Even though this isn't even out yet, it's already amassed over 10 million pre-registrations across PC and mobile, which is a mind-boggling figure for any release, but it's kind of par for the course for MiHoYo who have cracked the code when it comes to straddling the mobile and core gamer landscapes. Star Rail is a more sci-fi focused spin on their familiar gacha formula, and it looks pretty nice to be honest. This is of course free to play except for all the microtransactions, and it's hitting PC and mobile on the 26th, and PlayStation sometime in the future, no date locked in just yet. The last case of Benedict Fox is on plenty of people's radar at this point, a narrative-led 2D side-scroller with one of the most gorgeous art styles we've seen in a hot minute. This was revealed last year at Xbox's E3 showcase, and since then has kept a pretty low profile. Still, each subsequent trailer has looked better than the last, and and come the 27th, PC and Xbox owners will get the chance to play through this one themselves, made much easier by its inclusion on Game Pass. Not bad. Live Alive is a remaster of a classic SNES-era JRPG. The remaster was released for Switch last year, but on the 27th, it'll arrive for both PC and PlayStation. It is a Square Enix title, so of course, it will not be coming to Xbox. Don't be ridiculous. What is coming to Xbox is Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. Rise hit PlayStation and Xbox earlier this year after its Switch exclusivity window wrapped up. So as not to overload you, Capcom delayed the release of the Sunbreak expansion until now, but here it is. And don't forget that you can still grab the base game on Game Pass for both PC and Xbox console. Final and biggest release of the week, in terms of hard drive space at least, is Star Wars Jedi Survivor, sequel to the smash hit Jedi Fallen Order released a few years ago. This one comes from Respawn born as part of EA's ever-growing and surprisingly strong Star Wars portfolio. Fallen Order was by no means a masterpiece, being held back by some clunky combat, some tropey open world stuff, and some weird Dark Souls stuff that didn't sit quite right in the Star Wars universe. But the storytelling, the visuals, the lore, and the ending, man, it was so fucking cool. It was just 
top-notch Star Wars fare. The sequel is promising more of the same without being too specific about gameplay changes. I mean, to be fair, if it's just the same game, but a new chapter in this saga, then I'd be okay with that, since the storytelling really had me wrapped around its little finger in the last game. If the game itself is good, then that's a nice bonus. I'm hoping to have a review out for this one prior to release, but I can't promise you that yet. If you'd like to be notified if and when that review goes live, use the force and click the subscribe button with the for, I don't know, just subscribe. I'm not really sure where I was going with that one. Okay, moving right along. Uh, put this on your radar. Everywhere, in all directions, destruction has claimed dominion. Back in January of 2016, a studio by the name of Red Hook self-published a breakout smash. It was called Darkest Dungeon, and it was every bit the dungeon-crawling roguelite that was all the rage at the time, but there were some things that really set it apart. The art style for one, like a western gothic take on the chibi style you'd find in a JRPG. The other standout feature was the psychological stress mechanic, manifesting in gameplay the unimaginable pressure that dungeon divers would likely be under, were they regularly running into scores of skeletons who wanted to spill their guts with scimitars. Well, some seven years later, Red Hook are about to release a sequel, Darkest Dungeon 2. It promises more of the same party-based, turn-based, roguelike gameplay, and this time the game has had a significant presentation glow up thanks to its exploration now happening via carriage rides through doomed 3D landscapes. This art looks truly incredible, and it's just one of the reasons I'm keen to check this one out. Good news, we won't have to wait long for it. Darkest Dungeon 2 has spent the past year in early access on the Epic Game Store, but it's hitting 1.0 on May 8th, and it's coming to Steam. If you'd like to wishlist it ahead of that date, I profiled it over on my Steam curator page, which also has links to all of the other put this on your radar stuff I've recently covered. I'll leave a link to all of that below the like button. Sort of free stuff time now, and it's the last week of the month, so be sure to grab all your PS Plus titles, your games with gold, and your prime gaming stuff before it disappears for good. Epic are back as always, this time with four free games you can grab over the next week. Two of them are up right now. They are Beyond Blue, a narrative-led subnautical exploration game, as well as Never Alone, a charming 2D side-scroller made in collaboration with some of Alaska's native people, celebrating a story passed down through generations. The two other titles arrive on April 28th, and they are Poker Club, which I'm assuming is some sort of card game, I don't know. The other is Breathage. I wish I could offer this one a sterling endorsement as Subnautica, but in space is kind of a slam dunk premise. Still, Breathage manages to find a way to screw it up with some absolutely relentless and relentlessly unfunny dialogue and the back end of the game completely ignoring any of the base building and exploration that made the first part quite enjoyable. Worth adding to your epic library, but probably not worth booting up, sadly. Game Pass got its monthly refresh this week as well, though it is a quieter month than usual. The last case of Benedict Fox is on there, as I mentioned earlier. Cassette Beasts is maybe one to check out if you're at all a fan of Pokemon. The headline act, though, is Redfall, which is facing all sorts of backlash owing to its always online requirement, its de novo on PC, its lack of cross-party progression when playing co-op, its somewhat questionable-looking combat and loot, and most concerningly, its 30 FPS cap when playing on console. Not a great look to be capping your flagship AAA title at 30 FPS when you're crowing about having the world's most powerful console. I bet Bethesda's technical teams are sweating bullets trying to get Starfield running at 60 FPS on Series X. Will they get it done? Based on the technical state of previous Bethesda game releases, I have no reason to doubt them at all. Feel good story for the week time. And you know, everyone always asks, would you survive the zombie apocalypse? But no one ever asks, what happens if you die in the zombie apocalypse? I mean, sure, you'd probably become a zombie, but how might your friends and family remember you and honor your untimely passing into the land of the walking dead? That is why, and I wanna stress that this is real, a UK insurance company has partnered up with Dead Island 2 to deliver the death wish insurance policy. And again, this is real. The policy involves two things. Number one, locking your corpse in a giant unbreakable metal box so that if you do turn after death, you are trapped underground, clawing at the steel until your zombified fingernails fall off. And two, the policy covers the cost of your friends and family to fly to LA to party for a week in your honor. This policy comes from Dead Happy, a company who are focused on, quote, changing attitudes to passing away and promoting positive ways to remember loved ones, end quote. And it cites a study that they did that found that 40% of adults surveyed don't want to return from the dead as a flesh-eating zombie, which implies that 60% of people are okay with it. Honestly, I'm not really sure. Put me in the maybe pile, I guess. This policy will cost you some £8,000 and is not legally binding, so really you're just giving this company £8,000 for a laugh, but hey, makes for a nice tie-in with a zombie game and we got a cool infomercial out of it. Get dialing today and remember, please die responsibly.
Ladies and gentlemen, here we are once again at the end of the show, which means it's time for me to get back to work. Jedi Survivor isn't going to review itself now, is it? I hope you enjoyed yourself today. And if you did, could I ask a favor? Clicking the like button is a very big deal to the YouTube algorithm. Papa Google eats that shit up. So if you want to help your boy out, then a click would be hugely appreciated. Like I said, big week of content, plenty to look forward to. So if you want to be here for it, be sure to subscribe and ding that notification bell. Thank you again for tuning in. I always appreciate it. And a big thanks to this week's sponsor, Ridge. I would just like to take a moment to thank this video's sponsor, Ridge. Ridge aren't just sponsoring this video, by the way. They're actually an official sponsor of the channel for all of 2023. We did a few shouts last year and they came back to me this year and they said, how about we make it official? And I'm like, sure thing. Let's put a ring on it. Ridge sell rings, by the way. That's an actual thing they do. Personally, I'm most into their wallets and key cases. I've been using a Ridge wallet for many years, well before they sponsored the channel. I saw it advertised on another YouTube video. I bought one and the rest is history. I never looked back at the old bulky leather wallet I used to have because Ridge wallets are the wallet evolved. Store all of your essential cards, your cash using the money strap or money clip, protect yourself from scammers with RFID protection and look like a classy dude because these things are sleek and stylish and come in a range of colors and materials, allowing you to rock whatever look works for you. There are other products there too, like their excellent backpack, their bolt action pens and tons more. All of it is worth a look and all of it is 10% off when you use offer code SKILLUP at checkout. Visit ridge.com forward slash SKILLUP and get 10% off store wide. Link below in the description and the pinned comment. Thanks Ridge for sponsoring the channel for 2023 and a big thank you to you out there for watching the videos since Ridge would not be supporting the channel if it weren't for you guys. Appreciate it and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.